I remember correctly, something like exploration, exploitation, uh, something, something, <laughs> expansion. Extreme stunts. This week on Backward Compatible, with the release of No Man's Sky next, Doc, Chris, and Nick revisit previous discussions by brainstorming their ideal exploration game. Plus, Root, Cytus 2, World Building Notes, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode 133 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Nick. Hey. And with the recent release of the No Man's Sky update, No Man's Sky Next, uh, we decided to sort of give the game another look, and there's some interesting stuff we want to talk about there. Uh, But we thought we'd bring that into a discussion on what we think our ideal exploration game would be. This is something we kind of touched on before the last time we talked about No Man's Sky after its initial release. Um, But now what we're going to be doing is sort of applying our sort of hypothetical game design treatment to it, where we uh, come up with an idea and then talk about how we would actually design a game to bring that out. Uh, So that should be a fun discussion uh, but first we have some opening segments for you including the button mosh get ready for the button mosh where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately you know i, I gotta admit um no man's sky is the game that i love to hate slash hate to love same um i'm a couple hundred hours in and that's up there with any other game that i've truly loved like oh i don't know fallout yeah so by hours clocked uh, i i can't argue um, with the fact that it has been a successful purchase for me despite the grief and frustration that i had for it initially and the sameness that still seems to creep back in what's your experience been like so i don't have nearly as many hours as you i've got uh, about 25 maybe 30 still that's a that's a lot actually yeah well it was about 10 hours in the original game and then maybe like 20 ish okay in the new patch and did you restart for the new patch yes i did okay because i did not Mm. i actually kept my old save file which has caused some interesting problems um that are totally my own fault but i'll i'll come i'll come (laughs) back around to those yeah so my experience with the game was uh with the original patch i was very excited about the game at first for about the first five hours or so. And like everybody else, that excitement went away when I realized that it was the same experience on every solar system, basically. When we were told the game would be a certain thing and it wasn't the thing we were told it would be. Yes. Nor were we told that improvements would be made and it would eventually become the game we were promised. Yeah. I mean, which was my beef. If you want to hear my rant on that, I'm not going to repeat it, but it's on a previous episode. You know, I think really it comes down to um, is that my argument against it in the beginning was there just wasn't enough content and that it wasn't truly procedural. It was random. Right. So my question, I guess, for you would be, do you feel that it has risen to the place where you might call it more procedural and less just random? I would say it is a little bit more procedural because um, one of the major features that they added was uh, actually, I don't know if they even if this is a new feature or not, but it's new to me, Mm -hmm. um, is the. The, the fact that certain types of stars have different kinds of planets around them. Right. So you need to build a special warp drive to get to red stars, and then yes. you have to get stuff on red star planets to build a drive to get to green stars, yeah. and so on. And they actually nerfed the old drives uh, as a result of that. And so I was able to jump five or six star systems all at once to try mm-hmm. to get back home. And now I can't. Right. But what's interesting is, um, I think when they regenerated the universe, which they did, uh, one of the things they did was they adjusted the distance between stars. And I think it all comes out in the wash, but I'm not completely sure. Um, Ultimately, it's about gameplay. And I think this makes for better gameplay. Mm -hmm. Because if you're skipping four stars that don't matter in 15 quintillion worlds, it is not helping you. Yeah. 
Especially since essentially all the stars are kind of the same. <laughs> they, that's, that's, yeah, that's exactly the right. So I think if there was more of a, let's scan the local, let's, let's call it um, neighborhood, and there's 16 stars in the neighborhood, and you can choose from those 16 stars, but that's not, that's not even really a thing. You just have sort of the color of the star to go by. Right. And now since you know what might be potentially be in those kinds of stars. Like I think it's the red stars and the green stars you were telling me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause see, I don't even have that technology after, yeah. after all the hours I've played, I'm playing such a very different kind of game. First of all, than was intended. And second of all, then you seem to be playing right. that. I think that there needs to be a community uh, of compare, a comparative analysis, let's say <laughs> in order to truly understand what this game is. Yeah. And before we start calling it samey. Right. Because the, um, the experience I'm having is of a kind of progression um, where I start out in a very sort of comfortable uh, environment with the yellow stars, which is the default. Um, obviously, there's some weird planets there with like, you know, acid rain or whatever. Um, sure. But then the first red star I landed on, or the first planet around a red star that I landed on. After upgrading your technology so you could. Yeah, it was made out of like glass or something, but it was a very... Like, just very weird alien world, and that that star system didn't have a space station around it. I gotta say, the visuals have been slowly improving yeah. more and more and more, and, and they, they started out pretty grand. Mm-hmm. A little little cartoony, but that was that worked. It was right. great. And so I'm, I'm actually very happy now um, that the flora and the fauna and the rocks, uh, minerals, if you will, are uh, a little more complicated and a little more... And a little more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you don't get the, the the weird distorted animals anymore. I think it's a little more curated, if you will. Um, and that, to me, speaks of procedurality rather than of randomness. Right. But then again, that's my experience. Right. So far, um, I'm happy and glad I gave them my money and hope that they use it to continue to develop the game. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a friend of mine <laughs> posted the other day and said, oh, uh, look at this, there's this game and it's called No Man's Sky and it looks really awesome. And he just had never heard of it. And so <laughs> I, his I entry him. point... <laughs> or yeah. I envy him, I should say. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is is there's a lot of people I think who are going to discover the game who weren't in on the original caustic sort of environment behind it. And I think that that gives me hope. I yeah. think I think there's a lot, there's millions and millions and millions of players out there who are going to have a great time. Yeah, Hello Games is getting close to redeeming themselves. I don't know if they've quite gotten there yet. But. Well, right now, it's at the stage that I wanted it to be at release. Yeah. I now have the game I wanted when I didn't get the game I wanted yeah. and got the game I got. Well, now you've got a game. <laughs> well, there's that too. It has missions and everything. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. It has it's, things to do. And interestingly, it's not the game I'm playing. I'm playing my own mission, which is to get home. Yeah. Interesting. But, you know, I can, and that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. We'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. There's a new game that just came out by a company called Leader Games, or if you prefer, Letter Games, which is probably how it's pronounced. It's a, it's by a man named Letter, and L-E-D-E-R, and so he named the company after himself, which I think is just incredibly arrogant. Don't you, Kruger? Well, who would ever name a company after themselves? Yeah, certainly not me, Doc, and Hugh Kruger. <laughs> uh, that's DocAndKruger.com, by the way. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> Letter Games is how I presume it is pronounced. Um, one of the things about the, let's call it more recent games that have come out from them, is that every player around the table of this uh, board game has uh, different mechanics. And so the first one that came out was called Vast, and it's had lots of expansions. It did pretty well on Kickstarter, etc. Um, and now the new one is called Root, R-O-O-T. And think of it as kind of a uh, board game love letter to Redwall if you will, um, in the sense that you are, um, you know, mice and rabbits and foxes and squirrels and there's snake people or maybe they're lizards. I don't know. Um, but, but there's otters. Um, and, and each of them has their own little society. And what they're trying to do is gain control of the forest. And the way that you do that is through a pretty typical kind of uh, victory point gain uh, mechanic, and uh, the difference being that everybody gets victory points different ways, and it feels a little bit like a a map game with a 
like an army mechanic, but I don't even want to say that because there's one, uh, there's one who's not even a, a race at all. Um, he's actually just a single character who wanders around and makes alliances. And he's kind of like the rogue character who influences and plays Kingmaker. And then you've got the snakes who are making sort of a, a religious uh, pilgrimage and they're trying to grow gardens. That's their, that's their thing. And they count as having dominance if there's a garden there, no matter how much of an army is there. And they can do conversions and have acolytes and so on. And then there's the cats and the cats do what cats do. They, they hunt down the marmots and, uh, they, they go on straight up all out war. And then there's the, I know, right. <laughs> and, and then there's the resistance and the resistance is mice. And it's so cool. Cause what you have to do is gain influence, which is not, it's not army, it's a token. And so it's not actually warriors. It's just locals who are sympathetic. And then you have an uprising and the revolution begins. And then suddenly all these mice appear and they start fighting with the cats and the everything else. I'm just imagining this happening in like my backyard garden. I know. And the art is so wonderful in the game that it's, uh, it, the visuals are so stunning that it's actually really, really easy, uh, to be drawn into the world. And in fact, um, you know, if you are a, a Redwall fan or even mouse guard, uh, to reference that, you know, Luke Crane, uh, wonderful mashup, it, it's really worth checking out. There's a high barrier to entry in letter games though. Um, as with fast, you really have to sit down and expect to spend the night on your first game because everyone has to learn what everyone else has to do and everyone's rules are different and you will play it wrong. And then you will want to play it again. I predict, (laughs) um, that's what happened with us. And, uh, now that I've played three or four games, I, there are other races that I want to try and I haven't, been able to do those yet. And so I'm like, bring it again next week to game night. And it's going to be like four or five weeks before we're able to all play all the races we all want to. (laughs) And that's how often does that happen? I mean, the last time a game like that happened for me, it was Scythe, um, just because of the uniqueness of Scythe. So I, I highly recommend Root for experienced gamers, inexperienced game groups. You're going to find, uh, that some of the mechanics will work for you and some of them will not work for you. Choose your races appropriately. Choose your strategy appropriately. Um, I, in the end, found uh, a race that was the birds, who are the rightful owners, by the way, of the <laughs> uh, the glade. And they are wanting to take it back from the cats. And so the way they do this is by setting out a little program, sort of robo-rally style, if you know that reference in that game. And you actually run your, your program every time. Hmm. It's a little mechs and minions kind of mechanic. And I just, it's so good and it's so different. Um, but it could also be really, really maddening to try to learn all of the intricacies of it. Um, but either way, it's worth checking out before it gets too crazy and too big and too expensive. Root, R-O-O-T, uh, Letter Games. It's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. So I actually wasn't entirely sure what segment this should be because in a sense it is competitive gaming, in a sense it's also watching someone play a game, but it's not quite a let's play in that sense. I don't know, but uh, you're getting really meta right now, so yeah. I'm thinking gaming meta. I was going to say gaming meta too, but you know, it's a little bit more specific than just general industry and culture. I guess that would fit as well, but I've settled on Get Wrecked because what we're talking about today is the uh, Overwatch League Grand Finals. Um, this oh, happened. This is clearly a table talk, <laughs> right? This happened a few weeks ago. Um, there was three weeks worth of playoffs, including the grand finals. Um, there was a six team playoffs, so basically the top six teams in the league from the regular season. Uh, I think it was something like a six month long season. So a very long kind of haul for these players. Kind of crazy. They had their playoffs and we ended up with the uh, London Spitfire versus the Philadelphia Fusion uh, in the grand finals. Um, and the grand finals are actually held rather than in the Blizzard Arena in Los Angeles, where which is where the regular season took place uh relatively small venue um it packs in a good number of people but i wouldn't guess more than like a thousand tops i'm actually not sure what the capacity is you know last time london went up against philadelphia there was a a little revolution involved. <laughs> Just saying. I'm, I'm sure that parallel was drawn at some point. Um, but the grand finals were held in the Barclays Center in New York. Uh, 
And so I think that one had like a capacity crowd of something like 12,000. And so it was really cool to see um, the game and the league happening on this sort of big stage. It had a much bigger uh, display than they usually do. Um, much bigger stage to play on, like they literally the stage. artist DJ Khaled. <laughs> yeah, DJ Khaled did a pre, <laughs> pre, uh, pre-game concert at one point. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't actually watch that one. Oh, um, shame. <laughs> I'm, I'm not cool enough to watch any of this <laughs> but it was just really neat to see um you know I, i've been following the overwatch league all season nick you and eric actually joined me on uh, friday nights pretty much every week to watch whatever was going on i'm usually looking at my phone but yeah yeah but you know it's 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 kind of like a an alternate sports experience in a sense you can hang out with people and watch the game and you know that sort of thing i'm here for the pizza <laughs> um, as far as the game itself, it was actually a little bit um, disappointing, I will say, uh, because you know, the, the whole thing is everyone was really hyped up about this matchup between two really great DPS teams. Um, some of the best DPS players in the world, arguably, were on these two teams. And so um, everyone was really excited to see how that would go down. But uh, despite a little bit of kind of competitiveness in the first couple of games of um, game one, it was basically best three out of five in a game and then best two out of three games wins. Uh, so game three would only happen if needed. The first couple of rounds were kind of competitive, but then London just started running away with it and ended up winning game one, three to one. Um, and then on game two, London just swept Philly three uh, zero and the first half, especially Philadelphia just didn't look very good. And, you know, it's one of those things we're not quite sure if it's that they weren't performing up to their standards or if it's just that London was like way overperforming uh, and just totally dominating them. Um, the tank play of London was just super impressive and they managed to shut them down. Um, and then in round three, uh, Philadelphia had a little bit more life to them. Um, but then London still ended up steamrolling them. So, uh, in a way, if you're a London fan, you're probably happy. But even I was talking to a London fan and he was saying that, uh, you know, the game was actually still kind of boring and disappointing, despite the fact that his team was winning so dominantly. It reminds me of that super year, super bowl a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. Seattle versus whoever, mm-hmm. and it was just a train wreck yeah <laughs> yeah and so you know you always kind of hope that especially if you, your team isn't in the running that you at least get a entertaining game in the grand finals um it wasn't as good as it could have been uh but at the same time the the sort of uh, pomp and circumstance of it was kind of cool to see and um i think a lot of people were definitely very excited now about season two because they got to see what the overwatch league could look like um and hopefully uh, next season we'll see uh, Dallas up there in the top. I don't know if they'll make the grand finals, but uh, based on stage four, I think that they're on the right track to, I think, have a better season. Than they did this this past season. So uh, all that is to say, burn blue uh, and we'll see you guys in season two. Now is the time for reading list in which our impeccable curators recommend the finest materials for your reading, listening and viewing pleasure. So it's been a little while since we've done a reading list uh, on the podcast. Um, This one is for a YouTube channel called World Building Notes. So there's kind of a um, a sort of subgenre on YouTube of videos discussing fantasy writing and tips for creating world building ideas and stuff like that. Um, I've never really been a big fan of them for the most part because they tend to be... um, you know, an absolute beginner's guide to making sure your rivers are going the right direction, that sort of thing. (laughs) It's like, okay, this isn't really contributing much to my knowledge of (laughs) writing or anything like that. Um, But I found this YouTube channel entitled World Building Notes. Um, It is one person, and the concept is that she's basically just building a world from scratch throughout the entire thing. And her bent, as far as I can tell, is that she seems to be an artist. And so what she's focused on is... um, there are story implications that come from it, but she's do, really doing a lot of sort of visual world building where mm-hmm. she's uh, coming up with how a lot of things are going to look. So you get a very sort of cohesive um, aesthetic mm-hmm. thing. Um, so it's definitely a different approach that I've tended to see in world building um, sorts of stuff that are focused a little bit more on the fiction. Right. Um, I'm afraid I don't uh, quite know much about the background of the channel i'm pretty sure that she at one point had a web comic in a world that she built um but her channel it doesn't really make reference to it um but so i guess the visual bent makes sense mm-hmm. um the first few episodes actually are really interesting it's basically the process of her building her world from scratch as i mentioned so the first episode is just um 
the first couple episodes are like, let me invent all of the plant and fungi species for this for this island that this world is. Mm -hmm. And then I'll invent the food chain by creating animals to eat those. Mm -hmm. And then I'll figure out how humans fit in in this food chain. Mm -hmm. And then I'll figure out because of the stuff on this island, how is human society like? Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a very bottom up approach yeah and it's like i said a very different approach than you tend to get because these are sorts of the details that i think doc you and i would agree mm -hmm. as a writer these are details that you don't think about until you kind of need to um until it's actually important to the story so we typically aren't going to care what sort of like 12 different species of flora there are right in this in the scene we're more about you know the society and maybe how that is affected by maybe the animals we hunt and the things that they eat or whatever mm -hmm. um but yeah she's going into just a lot of detail about like just the nitty-gritty of every little aspect yeah. of this world because she has to draw it out actually her most recent video which came out five days ago is kind of a meta discussion on mm -hmm. that kind of topic mm -hmm. where basically her thesis is that a world should be able to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. um, worlds are interesting in and of themselves. Yeah. She talks about, uh, you know, a lot of the fantasy books that she read as a kid were more interesting to her for the worlds than for the crappy stories that were set in those worlds. Um, so I think just getting, just watching this for some inspiration maybe is, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot more interesting to me to see somebody else's creative process than to, you know, watch a tutorial or whatever mm. like this is a lot more i guess advanced <laughs> yeah and no, i mean and having watched a little bit of this myself i actually do find it quite fascinating mm -hmm. uh, again seeing her creative process and the amount of thought that does go into um that sort of like procedurality of working from the bottom up to build right um this world very holistically even if it wasn't being made for a story just as a world building project almost world building as a hobby yeah um this is kind of taking it in a direction that i think you can argue like it's just it's worthwhile as a world building endeavor yeah mm -hmm. and if you're into biology if you're into evolutionary biology if you're into uh you know geology or anything like that you'll probably find this pretty entertaining <laughs> This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So I've talked before about one of my uh, favorite mobile games, Fire Emblem Heroes. And interestingly enough, there was a feature of that that came out a while back that was sort of a basic rhythm game of sorts. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, but it's not like, you know, a super amazing game unto itself. It's just kind of like a fun little diversion. But it did get me thinking about uh, rhythm games because it's been a while since I've played any. Um, I'm thinking back to like, you know, Guitar Hero and Rock Band back in the day. And so around that same time, I happened to see a kind of a featured article thing on the um, iOS app store uh, about uh, rhythm games. And so I was kind of intrigued by that. And I ended up looking into one of them called Cytus 2. This is a game by uh, Ray Arc Games. It's kind of set in this sort of cyberpunky, futuristic kind of thing. But obviously the emphasis isn't on the story. The story is something more that comes about incidentally through kind of like discovered um, instant messages between people or logs of um like you know emails or calls or whatever else but um actually really good music in there and i think what they tend to do is they sort of put out calls to the greater music community around the world to kind of contribute songs to and if they find stuff that they like they'll sort of put those into the game um chart them out uh, and actually, this company has a lot of different uh, rhythm games. Their model seems to be either give you something free or very cheap that's got like a good little selection or maybe a weekly rotation. This one doesn't have a rotation. It's more just like a starter pack. Um, and then if you want to expand it, get different artists, different styles, you can pay money to get um, additional stuff. But basically, the base game, I think it's something like three or four dollars, um, gives you three different artists that are pretty cool. Um and these artists are actually characters with a sort of representative style. So in universe, it's one artist, but it's actually multiple artists that kind of make up their discography. Kind of like a, a techno EDM, some J-pop influences are is kind of like the built-in music selection for the beginning of the game. And they have this really interesting um, mechanic where, you know, you're used to a lot of rhythm games kind of having like the multiple track thing where you sort of tap stuff when it comes down to it. And this one, actually, the line moves up and down on the screen back and forth. Uh, and you see things kind of like growing bigger and then you have to tap it when the line sort of reaches it. The higher end difficulty levels get really crazy. <laughs> uh, so uh, definitely need to work your way up. But if you're interested in rhythm games or just kind of seeing what this is about, I think it's worth checking out for sure. Cytus 2. C-Y-T-U-S. And now 
this week's meaty topic of discussion. All right, so this is a exercise we've done before on the cast. Uh, I think we've done it before with the Halloween special where we were talking about designing a scary game. Um, spooky. A, a spooky game. Um, Didn't you say you wanted to design, like, Westworld as a video game? Maybe it wasn't Westworld. Oh, yeah, so we talked about um, what we would do if you're we designing a pariahism into okay. a game. Um, and then I think we were talking about, like, could we make a video game that sort of did what Westworld does? Is pariah the one about uh, the prison? Um, is the guy who got out of prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so what we're going to be doing today is talking about uh, kind of designing, if not like the ideal exploration game, maybe an ideal exploration game based on whatever ideas we think we want it to express. And so, we're talking about space exploration, right? Or just uh, exploration in general? I would. It could be exploration in general. That's maybe a question for our design. You know, do we want to make it about space? Do we want to make it about, um, you know, say like a... Uh, you know, exploring the new world or whatever the case would be. Or well, given equivalent. Andromeda and some of the other things that have been out, I think talking about it in the context of a space game, mm -hmm. uh, like No Man's Sky and some of the recent changes mm -hmm. would be a good context to narrow it down. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So let's to call keep it the space focus. exploration. Yeah. Or even that. just, you know, sci-fi, uh, genre space type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, of course, uh, given that Hello Games, uh, listened to our last podcast, took all of our suggestions and included it in next. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, take notes guys. Yeah. Cause this is going to be awesome. And, uh, we only want like what? 25% of the royalties, mm -hmm. the 50. We can work that out. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. We'll work it out later. Yeah. yeah. Sean Murray, this is for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we love you. Did that, did that get weird? So when we were talking about no man's sky, uh, a couple of years ago. And I think what we were talking a lot about was just incidentally, we weren't trying to redesign the game. We weren't trying to design something from the ground up, but then hello games just, you know, took us up on that, I guess. <laughs> but we were sort of throwing out ideas of how, how we thought the game could be better. What might have changed about it that might've made it a little bit more interesting. And so one of the things that I thought of, for example, uh, and probably a few others sort of pitched into this or vice versa, where um, if you were kind of, a front runner for some sort of empire mm. where you kind of have your home system, your home cluster or whatever the case might be where things are established and you've got bases and you got other people. Um, and then you sort of strike out into the unknown and it wasn't just a matter of, Hey, go see things, but actually you're looking at th looking for things with a certain objective in mind. So if your empire that's behind you, whatever the case might be is interested in, habitable planets or planets that would make for good um you know military outposts or they're looking for particular resources or whatever the case might be um you have something to look for if that makes sense um and they may be even doing something along the lines of um helping to build outposts or helping to kind of uh establish these for forward bases where you can start to see the empire grow outward as you're doing stuff so you get a sense of uh accomplishment and things happening because of what you've done with your exploration. I think that that was one way I thought that could have been uh, a way to sort of improve and to give exploration a uh, more meaning in a way. It's actually a lot like uh, a 4X game. Um, those being, if I remember correctly, something like exploration, um, exploitation, uh, something, something <laughs> expansion, extreme stunts, expansion was one. And then like maybe extermination, basically okay. the, the cycle of, um, you know, finding resources acquiring the resources building your empire out and then taking out other empires it's civilization kinda, is the classic example. yeah civilization being the classic example but there are lots of them out there um, there's actually a space one out there too i mm -hmm. forget who made it and uh there's called. one called endless space that's, that's kind of like an indie project um even before that though there was galactic civilizations mm. um and i'm mean, actually 4x is a lot bigger genre than i think some people might think it's right. just that they're a little <laughs> bit more obscure typically yeah um so like, you know, sort of taking a 4X approach, I think could have been an interesting way to do it. Um, actually, Eric and I were talking off the air recently about um, another game that he was sort of he sort of saw uh, at a trade show. And I think it was called Yonder, a little indie game. And essentially, it's a very, very story light, kind of easygoing. You're playing as I think children 
and there's lots of cute animals. It's got like a sort of very um, soft and fun aesthetic. It's not meant to be like a harsh survivalist sort of game. Um, And it tends to take a little bit more of the Minecraft approach of um, you're rewarded with, you know, stuff that lets you know, hey, you can build this new thing, uh, something else that uh, No Man's Sky does at some point. Um, You can build this new thing. You gather the materials to make the thing. And now you have the new thing. Uh, and you just kind of keep doing that. But because it's a, not a procedurally generated environment, it's actually a designed environment. They're able to gate things in a way that makes some sense. Uh, so once you have this new item, now you can get to the next area. So there's some uh, almost like a Metroidvania kind of sense of progression. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also um, they can build in interesting things to find once you get there. So I think one of the issues that No Man's Sky tends to have is that because it's so procedural, um, it can feel basically like even though everything is technically nothing like everything else, everything is exactly the same as everything yeah. else. Yeah. Um, and so occasionally you find something that's kind of cool or interesting, or maybe if you have an objective, again, going back to the four X idea of um, you're able to, you're, you're looking for something for some end, then a discovery can be exciting because you found the thing you were looking for. Right. Well, with, with, with no man's sky, um, the first time you see a new kind of planet it's super exciting and interesting yeah it is like uh when that moment when you hit the button to scan it and find out if it's a paradise world or not yeah like i i was playing recently and for the first time i saw a planet that actually had like oceans and continents as opposed to just like a a random assortment of you know canyons and stuff and what i found really fun about that was that it was the first time i saw it and it was super exciting because I thought like, wow, this is rare and unique and exciting. And then in the same system, there were three more just like it. Um, so it turns out it wasn't that rare. But ever since that point, I've been finding new types of planets. And then my excitement has been kind of mitigated because uh, I know that I'm going to find more planets just like it. Variants on a theme hours. still. Yeah. yeah. My kind of golden standard for space exploration has always been um, Spaceman Spiff the character from the Calvin and Hobbes, uh, I was about to say web comics or not web comics, the old Calvin and Hobbes cartoons from the nineties or eighties. Yeah. That's back when the internet was on newsprint. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you only get it once a day. Right. So the, the concept behind spaceman spiff is that it's Calvin's imagination and he's pretending that he's a spaceman whenever he's in school or like, you know, bored or something. It's just active imagination running wild. And it's, um, you know, aesthetically, it's based off of a lot of 1950s sci-fi, you know, just space exploration stuff, kind of in the same way that No Man's Sky is. Mm-hmm. They have kind of that aesthetic more so than like a, a realistic right. sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And um, Calvin's kind of M.O. is just exploration for the sake of exploration. And, you know, there there will be storylines where like he goes onto a planet and he's kidnapped by, uh, you know, a, a band of like tribal aliens or something like that and it turns out his, it's his teacher and they're torturing him into making doing homework or something like that mm-hmm. but basically what i wanted out of no man's sky and kind of what i want out of a space exploration game ideally is spaceman spiff explore uh, mm-hmm. simulator which is just exploration for the safe, sake of exploration and every planet you go to you find something new and unique and an adventure is there waiting mm-hmm. for you yeah yeah i i agree and yeah, that's it, part of the problem mm-hmm. Um, that still persists with No Man's Sky is that you're meant to make your own narratives, but the elements of narrative are not there. Yeah, there's no adventure on any planet, really. There might be a guy in one of the trailer park buildings. Um, <laughs> I love that you call it that. <laughs> it's, it's accurate. It's, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, they've they've thrown a lot of new models down, and yeah. they're um, they're long. What, what would you call them? Species lines. Right. Um, for the different, what, four different alien species that have taken over the entire galaxy. Yeah. And apparently none of them know where they came from, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Um, so there's a deeper mystery there that I don't think can necessarily be um, answered. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, we are procedurally generated by someone. We're all living in a simulation. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where they're going with that, actually. And it's, it's, it's a fourth wall breaking. It's a thing. little, yeah. It's a little silly. Um, but, Ultimately, there could still be narrative elements there. Um, have yeah. you encountered a crashed 
uh, ship. Not not one of the small ships, but one of the big frigates. The crashed frigates. I've, yeah. Yes, I've encountered like five. <laughs> okay, so and the f- they're all crashed in exactly in conveniently exactly the same way. <laughs> the same way. Uh, but the first crashed frigate that I came across, I got really excited. Yeah, because that was so neat. And then I realized I could use my scanner to dig. Mm-hmm. and um, find stuff down there. And then I realized that the return on investment and actually doing it wasn't worth it. Right. And it kind of lost a little bit of the luster. And beyond that, then it was just, okay, I'm going to abandon it. What a shame. It's part of my story now. And then I went to another world and boom, there it was again. And yeah. that, that literally just kind of ruined it for me. Well, the first one you find is actually part of the main quest now. Oh, is it? If you follow the main, um, the main quest line in a new game. I'm not questing at all. Yeah. Um, on the main quest and I'm not even doing side quests because my mission is to find technology and get back to my starting world Mm -hmm. after going through two wormholes, which is like, uh, you know, 220,000, uh, light years away. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take me 2,200 jumps to get back. Right. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's my, that's my meta narrative, my personal narrative of playing Voyager. And that's arguably more interesting than any of the missions that they inc- included in the new patch. I'm aware of that. And that, <laughs> that yeah, and so that's what, part of the frustration. Yeah. And so what that brings to mind for me is um, the idea of, because like, like what you're talking about, Spaceman Spiff, what that also reminds me of is kind of the pulpy, uh, maybe sometimes based a little bit on history, kind of like spirit of exploration of like people who would strike out into the jungle yeah. or whatever. And then they come back with their their uh, tales, almost like Baron Munchausen style. Of, right. Uh, Did I ever tell you about the time I came across a you know indigenous uh, tribe? Then I helped them to you know displace these people and crown the king of whatever mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Um. And so like the it's like the the various adventures of Sir Explorer Man. The, yeah. You know? The adventures of Space Man's but Yeah. <clears throat> and so with that in mind, if it is sort of exploration for exploration's sake, or even if there's kind of like Doc, you have the end goal of your goal is to get from point A to point B and there's lots and lots of stuff in between that. And then essentially it's just a matter of um, like, I I sort of think of it as almost as survivalism with some other things along the way that create interesting sort of many interesting kind of procedural stories, emergent stories based on the idea that there's something getting between you and point B. Mm -hmm. Um, So you land on this planet to resupply and then there's, you know, maybe aliens there who attack you or whatever the case might be it's not so much that aliens attacked you just because you happen to be on the planet it's the extra context of you needed to stop at this planet in order to achieve your end goal uh and then you have the stories about the stuff that happened to you along the way if that makes sense um so you have something driving you forward because i think that exploration for exploration's sake will speak to some people but i think if you give them some sort of end goal something very specific of and that's why no man's sky has the resource collection cycle Mm -hmm. which works for no man's sky because a big part of the game is like upgrading your ship. And for that, you need resources. And then to get those resources, you need to mm-hmm. find other resources. And there's this it's big kind of complicated the, crafting tree. It's kind of the Minecraft cycle. Yeah, where it's Minecraft. But there's, there's enough people yes. who are motivated by, I want to achieve this thing mm-hmm. and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get the resources. Yeah, right. And spend so the once you too. finally achieve that thing, it's you're done. Coming back to our point about the uh, exploration and adventure, like finding aliens that who kidnap you or whatever. Um, that's actually reminding me of spore um when you get to the space stage uh it used to be kind of just like a resource collection uh sort of game where you get enough spikes to upgrade your ship to get more spice to upgrade your ship et yeah cetera. exactly um and then they later on added that uh what's it called i'm drawing a blank on the name of the expansion but it it gives you galactic the, heroes or something galactic like that. heroes yes that's what it is um it gives you the ability in the space stage to go down to a planet and play it almost like the creature stage again, like the, you know, the, the, the wow game mm-hmm. essentially. Um, except now you're, you're fully upgraded captain and you can upgrade your armor and give yourself new abilities and stuff like that. And the idea is that it's a little story that happens on the surface of the planet while you're out adventuring in space. It's like a short little quest wow style. Yeah. Um, and that's basically exactly what we're talking about mm-hmm. is, you know, because the, the stories that they build in with the game are um, things like, you know, help help me settle this dispute between these two warring tribes of aliens, you know, um, or delve into this dark dungeon and get the golden artifact. It's like kind of a lot of it's like playing up tropes of movies mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But yeah. it also gives you the ability to create your own mm-hmm. adventures for to populate other players worlds. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of run into the issue, too, of do you then 
And like, uh, let's just for the sake of this discussion, assume that what we are going for is kind of a um, you're exploring and you're encountering adventures along the way, yeah. if that's the sort of game they want to design. Um, so. The, the issue you could run into there is if you have pre made curated stuff like say in spore where they had like mm-hmm. a certain number of just sort of pre-made missions and then people could you know you could crowdsource having more stuff but then you run into the issue of like oh well, is it any good right. um is it basically just the same stuff you know that sort of deal um and so we've seen with games like say you know uh, mario maker in recent memory there are some really good community made things out there but is there enough first of all you need to have a really strong community around the game who's con- contributing stuff right um but then do you have um enough good things that aren't also just samey because everyone's using the same idea over and over. Right. Well, the way to solve that problem is to, um, you know, before you jump into the game, you know, go to the, the menu of levels that you can download and say, okay, which ones, which adventures do I want to have populate my world? Mm -hmm. You can even just have a curated pack picked by Mm -hmm. the developers. Like here, here are top 25 picks. The other alternative I would say is to have, these sorts of encounters also be procedurally generated and then you start getting into procedurally generated um quote unquote narrative stuff easier said than done much easier said than done but the point the kind of i think where i'm going with this for example though is sort of simulating the relationships between say two societies that are on the same continent or Mm -hmm. something like that where they're at war with each other and like there's just sort of certain tags that emerge from certain relationships being present in um this system Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um to whatever extent they're kind of procedurally just like placed there kind of give a mechanical value to learning their language and culture Mm -hmm. actually um oh yeah for sure uh and you know i could see something being uh the case where you know say you crash land and you are rescued by one of the societies and so not that you're requiring the player to treat that them as the good guys versus the other guys but the player might then kind of just by default think of them that way. So now I want to help this side rather than that side, even though the game never said that you're going to encounter these specific people and they have a feud with this other tribe, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting that we're approaching this with um, procedural generation in mind mm-hmm. because No Man's Sky kind of set up that mm-hmm. expectation for mm-hmm. space exploration. Yeah, and that's I think that's kind of like where I was going with this, too, is that we kind of have two ways of approaching this where mm-hmm. if we're trying to make a, an exploration game, I guess one of the questions would be, do we try to design the full experience uh, and let people just play through it and then, you know, be able to talk about, Hey, did you do this quest or okay, that quest? So I got to jump in because yeah. yeah. uh, the, the, there is a huge um, I, a misunderstanding. Is that too strong of a word with, with, with what it is that no man's sky did in terms of procedural generation. And the truth is they hit the generate, universe button once yeah now they hit it a thousand times in development but no one with the with the package that they quote unquote shipped they hit it once and it was a fixed set based on a algorithm that was set then they changed stuff and in the in the notes it says they quote reset the universe that almost ended everything for me. I was absolutely blisteringly mad that they were like, oh, by the way, we reset the universe. What does that mean? They don't, I mean, I honestly don't even know. Does it mean that everything that's been explored is still there, but the stuff that hasn't been explored, the other 15 quintillion worlds <laughs> are now going to be different? Or does it mean that everything is gone and reset and started over uh, or something else? And I don't know the answer to that. Mm, it I find it deeply disturbing. But what is not happening is the system is not looking at the experience you've been having and uh, procedurally generating the next thing that comes up as a result of right. that in the, let's call it the Diablo way. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, Diablo broke some things by trying to cheat and have a market, but that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I would actually love it if No Man's Sky was an activated market that was real, where if I found Album and Pearls, I could actually go to the market and do it. But then we're starting to get into MMO territory. Mm-hmm. And what I think is a really important pin to stick in this is to note that like the the tech tree static yeah. oh and then they changed it wiped it out and reset it to a new thing they did that like twice why not keep the old tech tree and also create an alternate tech tree from a different 
race. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then it's like, okay, which technology tree am I going down here? Am I going down the Viking uh, tech tree? Uh, so that certain things will not be available to me because they're simply not compatible with the pick another race, Corvex the GEC. The, yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. Corvex technology would be amazing because it would be like, um, oh, you you actually need something for biology to breathe. Sorry, we don't really do that. Yeah. But you know what? That could actually change the way you play the game and yeah. restrict which planets you explore. So like leave everything you have and do an, an alternate path. That would be amazing. Right. That's what I'm talking about. And so uh, I think that speaks to our overarching theme here by simply saying this, do not pretend that you are not curating an experience mm -hmm. and, and creating a linear you know, path and that's, that's, if you are. That brings me to what I was going to say, basically, is that what you have in No Man's Sky, for example, is essentially the same quest lines. And what they're doing is it's just like it doesn't matter specifically where in the universe it's happening. We're just going to say uh, this event happens and we're going to generate the destination you needed to go to within however many light years of your current location, maybe in this sort of star system or something like that. So everyone will have, you know, they need to go find this object or talk to this person, it will be technically on different planets or different space stations or whatever, but it's still essentially the same story. Yeah. And um, the story is going to be different for everybody because they're going to pick a different, just at random, they're going to pick a planet for story events to happen. Mm -hmm. So like, and so I kind of guess where my question is coming from is if we're deciding if we want to do curated or procedural stuff, um, or a mix or mix potentially i think with the i think with a if you're going to make a curated space game you have to have at least some procedural generation just to fill out the scale yeah, yeah. no i i agree with that but then there's the question of um do we just want to go ahead and build the experience and let everyone experience essentially the same thing with slight variations or do we want to go more in the direction of having even the sort of like the missions the encounters that happen change as you go along because in a sense, what you have is if you're going for like, you know, this new storyline that just came out, where you're trying to find Artemis or whatever uh, in the most recent expansion, mm -hmm. um, it's essentially the same quest line. The same events are going to happen. Um, and your end goal is to find this. Being. It's about being Wade Watts and Ready Player One. <laughs> um, See what I did there? Yes, I did. OK. Uh, and if you um, and that's even like a little bit more specific, you've kind of got more like story beats along the lines. But mm -hmm. if it's kind of like, you know, we're going back to the idea of point A and point B. Um, point B is finding Artemis and all these things are going to happen along the way. Could we then remove all of kind of the main story events, so to speak in between and just have it be a procedurally generated experience. Um, again, kind of going back to the idea of we generated these two tribes on this planet that you happen to stumble upon. Um, and you know, almost like a Mad Max style of you just sort of stumbled it through their conflict. Their mm -hmm. conflict was affected by your presence there, and then you move on. Right. Um, it kind of like having that be like almost a more free form middle with just a very specific beginning and end. Or do I like we want the Mad to... Max yeah. kind of example there. I would also point out the original um, Fallout's, which were very much about going into a town, discovering what was happening there, finding out what the stories there are, fixing the problems you want to fix, not fixing the problems you want to fix. And at the end of the game, when the credits roll, what basically happens is you see a little cutscene that says, uh, you know, that one town that you went to that one time, yeah, they all died because mm -hmm. you didn't really help them. Yeah. And, and that's interesting to me, mm -hmm. not saying that there needs to be credits necessarily, but, um, I, I, you know, I would point to one of the very few, uh, the, the JRPGs that I actually played, which is uh, the Final Fantasy Nine, Seven. Which one was it that, that you walk around and go into town and set, built, built that kind of way? All of them. Um, <laughs> but it, you get what I'm saying. It's yeah. it's a different kind of design. You walk into the bubble of that space, and mm -hmm. there's there's issues and that world feels like a, a constructed built real world and they're getting closer with the red worlds and the green worlds, but it's still not quite right. Yeah. So. I'm going to throw out some reckless speculation here. Um, Excellent. What was the name of the space game that Bethesda Game Studios announced to E3? Uh, Starfield? Starfield, I think yeah. it was, yeah. Um, so knowing absolutely nothing about the game other than the fact that the JPEG that they showed was a sp picture of a space station. <laughs> um, I'm going to say, let's just assume that it's going to be basically just a Bethesda game in space. <laughs> um, 
now let's let's take out the main quest of the Bethesda game and let's just make it so that's you just explore the world with side quests. They'll do that with the first mod, don't worry. Yeah. That'll be I think that'll be a good kind of mm-hmm. starting point for a space mm-hmm. ideal space game. Yeah, what because because that... what it'll be mm-hmm. is let's say 20 uh curated planets. Mm-hmm. And there's quests and quest lines on each of those planets. Mm-hmm. Um those are all curated. Everything is curated. Maybe mm-hmm. just to fill out the scale of mm-hmm. the planets. Yeah. Like if we want to have no man's no man's sky sized planets, you mm-hmm. can have procedurally generated swaths of nothing, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then like a canyon with a tribe in it. Mm-hmm. You know. Or even just that thing of like where you procedurally generated during the making of the game, but then there's no procedural generation happening the, when you launch yeah, the game. It's the dagger just, fall approach. Yeah. You basically yeah. bake yeah. bake in the world and then kind of go with that. It just makes it makes m- making the game. And easier. then you get the bobblehead effect, which is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so like what that reminds me of, and actually something that no man's sky reminded me of when it first came out was uh, freelancer, which is, you know, kind of like an early two thousands yeah. um, space game. Good mention. Um, Good mention. And that one Very had a fairly large universe and they had like lots of planets and star systems and stuff like that. But it was a pre-made world. Yeah. Knew, it wasn't so much an exploration game. But... It wasn't meant to be exploration. No, yeah. but it did remind me of that because of the mechanic or the system in no man's sky of being able to trade with people and, uh, you know, the whole idea of like buy low, sell high, that sort of deal. That was something yeah. that that was one of the ways you could play in Freelancer was to kind of like be a space trucker, so to speak. Space um, trucker. But then the main story was built more around action. And they had like this whole story of, um, you know, you get sort of like roped into this big, um, this big to do and uh, eventually become a fugitive. And you have to like run from the law and stuff like that. And then I try to clear your name and all this different stuff. You know, but- you, you, you bringing up space trucker mm-hmm. makes me think that the developers of Euro truck simulator should make a space game. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Could Excellent. Just be star fields for yeah. hours and hours. No, there's a board game called space truckers and there's a mobile version. Mm-hmm. So really, yeah, just throwing that out there. It's pretty good. And you, so, you saying, Chris, and so like if Starfield is basically like just to say Skyrim, um, but instead of traveling, let's let's be optimistic and say Morrowind. Sure. Uh, but, you know, it's <laughs> it's basically just like any Elder Scrolls Fallout sort of game where you've got the hubs and you've got the in between stuff. And basically what they're doing is giving you a bigger sense of scale by making instead of walking across a field, you fly across an expansive space to get to another planet, which is a zone with a city yeah. and all this different stuff. Well, what I want is like seven Skyrims. Mm-hmm. Each of them are their own planet. Yeah. And so then. I think if you were just to do that, though. You wouldn't have this. I mean, it would be exploration from the player's perspective, but it's not a game in which you're playing as an explorer, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Why not, though? What if they're all uncharted planets? If they are uncharted planets that have been kind of like pre-built, then, yeah, I think that could work. Um, My thought, though, is if it's something like, you know, again, a Skyrim, a Fallout, the world is basically known to everyone. You might discover some little secret somewhere in there, but for the most part, it has been charted and there are people living there there are things that exist there if that makes sense well here's the conceit see with an explorer game type such as myself um what you have is over the next hill mystery Mm -hmm. uh if you prefer chaos uh you know it's the unknown it's the uh, there might be a dragon that will kill me and i mean that in the metaphorical sense not in the literal skyrim sense um but in the case of skyrim it literally was potentially a dragon which was amazing yeah and so That's what happens in No Man's Sky whenever you hit that warp button is what's the next system going to be like? Is this the one? Mm -hmm. Is this is this the one that actually is going to say Paradise Planet? And it doesn't. And so then it's chaos and you're like, okay, do I conquer the chaos? How do I move on? What do I do? That works in a curated space, too. Mm -hmm. It's just that like Skyrim, which was a I mean, every inch of it was known because it was put, you know, put there, put together. um, It from the player's perspective there is no difference so yeah. if what we're talking about here is the novelty of nick's experience being different from my experience being different from chris's experience being different from the rest of the internet's experience guess what that pretty much requires a well it does it requires a procedurally generated mm-hmm. world or at least a very very big world or a very very big one a world so and, big that you can reasonably expect people to be able to like the the further reaches of stuff isn't going to be found by the same or by mm-hmm. the same thing won't be found by two people in right. close proximity and 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 therein lies two of the problems is first distinguishing is it procedurally generating as you go and reacting to the thing you're doing and learning from what you're doing and creating a world that is right for your experience almost like some sort of roguelike in a way right yeah. roguelike exactly yeah. the right 
exactly the right genre. Yeah, because or, after you beat the first stage in a roguelike, then you move on to the second one, which is a little bit different, but it's always going to be kind of the same. Yeah, and it's Let's kind of... Let's talk about Spelunky, for example. Kind of the learning first stage is procedurally generated, but always the same cave. And then the second one is exactly. a different kind of cave, but it's exactly. always procedurally generated. Exactly. And again, I would point to um, uh, Diablo. Yeah. Because what Diablo had Diablo. was basically they had parts of the world that were set, and you would go into dungeon dungeon has the same aesthetic the same missions mm-hmm. but the layout might be slightly procedurally generated and yes. then you move on to the next prescripted stage and there's a meta level to it too mm-hmm. you, you know you you might be in the system and the system is looking at your health and going okay look he has like no health packs and he's almost about to die i'm gonna throw this guy a bone and um trigger a nice set of, of health packs here or some easy enemies to kill or something like that and you can you can work that in so that it It feels like that moment where you almost died, Mm -hmm. which is a great moment, Mm -hmm. a great moment for us explorers where you're like, ah, Mm -hmm. yeah, I did it. Let me tell you this great story that I had, Mm -hmm. this thing that I did. And And that's completely different mm -hmm. from a pre-generated, pre-procedurally generated universe, which is basically a big screw you if you don't happen to luck on to the thing that you need. And that's a completely different experience and both are valid. Mm -hmm. So... Let's let's pretend that w- let's let's pretend we're making a No Man's Sky, but not procedurally generated. Mm-hmm. Um, so it would be kind of like the uh, I th- I think what No Man's Sky wanted was to have you know there's story reasons for each each star having a space station in it you know mm-hmm. but like well those are mechanical reasons actually yeah story those, well yeah it's t- it purely in. mechanical it's it's mechanical reasons and then they gave a half-assed story reason for it let's say okay um but for an explorer who wants to see even an established world it would be cool to be able to go to a new space station and be able to explore it like exploring a mall that's kind of what i want i agree with stations. that completely so what would have been interesting is if like there was let's say 20 star systems each with maybe five or six planets that were all pretty much curated mm-hmm. or procedurally generated with curated parameters mm-hmm. um and then all the space stations were also curated so when you go to a space station you know, you can explore it just like a planet i suddenly feel like you're talking about mass effect yeah because there were side worlds and side missions and those some of them were elements of them anyway were procedurally generated are you talking about andromeda uh yeah and so there's an important missing element then in no man's sky that i think could have made that sort of thing a little bit better this kind of goes back again to my idea of the empire behind you uh who are you and who sent you i think is important to that then because you can be exploring an inhabited civilized space yeah uh, and it's still new to you because this is the first time your society, your species, whatever's encountering it. You know, you can choose your species now. Yeah, you can. Yeah. It, every, it has no story. It impact, has no story yeah. impact at all. But, but suddenly, instead mm-hmm. of being the mysterious traveler, I can just go be a geck. Well, you see, that what's, in, uh, what's interesting it about that for me. is implicitly in the new storyline, the travelers are actually a specific species. Artemis is another traveler like you. Right. And so if you're assuming that you're going with the default race of like you are a traveler the species of alien mm-hmm. that kind of implies then that you actually do have some society back home and now you're striking out into the world as the first of your kind and that makes this no man's sky despite the fact there's a space station and a a, a um a trailer park on every planet <laughs> not um, every planet then not every planet but not anymore uh, not anymore <laughs> yeah but but the, it, the idea scarcity has actually gotten really good i think yeah but like the idea that so much of space is explored and populated yes um it's kind of like, you know, again, kind of going back to the parallel of, um, you know, in our own history, the exploration of the new world or whatever the case might be, or even before then, um, you've got this small little bubble of the existing world that is known collectively, but mm-hmm. not to you. Mm-hmm. And what you're trying to do is discover that for your people. Um, then I think that having to Nick's point, having like, you know, a lot of different space stations and stuff like that that you're exploring, um, makes it valid as a quote unquote exploration. Um, now if you're assuming that you are just a member of society, um, then you're exploring for yourself, but not, there's nothing more than just kind of like experiencing new things, which maybe is a valid approach, but I don't think it makes for particularly, I mean, I think that's totally valid. It's basically what Daggerfall was. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't know. I don't find it personally compelling. And maybe it's just because like the, where my headspace is, is kind of thinking of it 
whether directly or indirectly through the lens of actual space exploration, which is basically we're trying to learn more about the unknown. Um, right. I think in my ideal exploration game, whether or not it's a space exploration game, the real compelling force behind the exploration is the world, which is why I, you know, I'll ignore the main quest in a Bethesda game, particularly Skyrim, um, and just explore the world for hours on end. And I think that's what a lot of people do mm-hmm. is that they they don't care about the quests. They'll do the side quests um, or they'll just go climb to the top of a mountain because why not? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. And I think I think no matter what your character's background is or what the pretense for your exploration is, there is always going to be players who on one hand will follow the preset kind of path that you give them like the main quest and then there will always be players who just say screw it and do whatever they yeah, want. Yeah, that's the difference between an explorer and achiever actually. Right. And it's interesting worth noting that No Man's Sky was actually designed with the idea of it being built around four pillars, literally exploration, survival, combat and trading, which sounds a lot like the uh, four gamer types oh yeah uh if you take the the psychology quiz it's, that that was designed for mmos but i think it i think it applies um it, we were promised an mmo as part of the original package anyway <laughs> but hey now they've got multiplayer um and and we haven't done it but we should but you and i need to do this nick we need I've, to i've heard it's very clunky and hard to get used to but what else that could i have expected? i was gonna say <laughs> that, that's par for the course yeah. so um but you know i'm reminded of um tom hall's 10 commandments of game design um, and one of the commandments is it's never us versus them. And, mm-hmm. and I, and I love that quote. It's like the only one I remember off the top of my head, the other nine, man, whatever. But, um, it, that one I remember because it comes up so very often in my thinking whenever I'm playing a game and I come to a moment and I'm like, Oh, that's a gotcha moment. Yeah. That's what, uh, the designer just nerfed me or found, I found an invisible wall. There's constantly so much in no man's sky that's like you're having too much fun calm down yeah (laughs) and it's an overwhelming feeling that the game elements themselves are a barrier to success instead of the other way around yeah it's a it's a fundamental violation of the us versus them principle and that's the problem i have with it ultimately and that what i wanted to say with our overarching discussion is this Mm -hmm. we need to make it so that we are on the side of the player and going hey there's a universe out there. Let's go get it. And so you may think this is a cheesy example, but I actually think Enterprise, the TV show Enterprise, is a really great example here because the first couple of seasons were that sort of wonderment and excitement and exploration. And it really keyed into the where no man has gone before element of uh, Star Trek. But then 9 11 happened, uh, like literally the same year. Mm. And the entire mentality of America just dropped through the bottom and everybody got like PTSD clinical grade depression for about a decade. And the last half of that show, if you compare it to the first half of that show is dark, man. They like three season three is about nothing but them going into the deep reaches of space where you can't even communicate out of it to try to commit genocide against a species that wanted to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. heavy metaphor (laughs) it's dark dark and i think that that's that that's going to speak to this i want i want season one and two and four of enterprise i don't want season three of enterprise Mm -hmm. in my space exploration game Mm -hmm. i want the wonderment of going where no man has gone before i also not the revenge killing (laughs) of wiping out the uh, well actually i don't see why you can't have both well i suppose you could because if we're talking about the procedurally generated tribes or whatever that chris was talking about as an option you could but again it can't be on a rail Right. It has to be player types choosing mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Because what if you find a procedurally generated tribe that like reveres you as a god and they're like, oh, God, please wipe out our enemies. And then you go and you go do it. Yeah. But still, that's not the same as, uh, you know, having revenge because they killed Florida, right. which, by the way, is what happened in, in Star Trek. You can take Florida. I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I, I was My born. uncle lives there. <laughs> I was born there. So, I mean... <laughs> um, Sorry, Florida fans. And I, I was going to say, too, that what this has kind of made me think of at various points during our conversation is, I, I would say, like, one other 
aspect of an expo- exploration game. Uh, and this is something that is present to some extent in No Man's Sky, to some extent in Minecraft, and even to, um, you know, kind of Bethesda style adventure, which is survivalism. Um, cause I think that Nick, you're talking about like, you know, you're having too much fun, calm down. <laughs> a lot of that is, I think them trying to throw on a sort of survivalist aspect onto a game. That's not really emphasizing that. Now well, I think, and the stuff that I'm talking about is like, mm-hmm. you have too, you don't have enough room in your inventory yeah. to carry one more piece of carbon that you need to charge your thing. And, well, I think that plays <laughs> yeah. into survivalism because survivalism also is about like, how much can you carry? How Economy many resources and, do you have and all this different stuff? Yeah. And so you know, I think that a survivalist kind of approach can be great in sort of a get from point A to point B thing where one of the challenges of doing that is making sure you have the resources and the ability to do that and making sure that you uh-huh. live long enough to actually get to that point. Which brings us to the probably biggest problem of all in No Man's Sky, which is that whenever you win, get to the center of the universe, whatever it is you're trying to do, complete the storyline, you get to start over yeah, without so much as a well done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you get to keep your resources or do you just start spawning? Don't know. Never galaxy? done it because yeah. I'm going the other direction. Right. I'm actually going towards the edge of the universe yeah. home rather than back towards the, the other. Well, I see the right. other thing too, that's interesting to me about that is that you have the goal of getting to the center of the universe and it's implicitly just as a like, Hey, explore this far, but there's a whole nother half, maybe even more than a half of the universe waiting for you past that point. And so if it's all about just the the joy of exploration and seeing new things, then there's really no need for you to reset at that point. Um, you just find some other goal. There's also yeah. no gain mm-hmm. because everything is the same. Yeah, it's not like there's different regions of yeah. the galaxy that have different. In fact, the only regions, quote unquote, are the different kinds of mm-hmm. stars. And so I think mm-hmm. that that's one of the things that we need to design into our hypothetical game that we're working on is what is the end goal if there yes. is one? I would love it if I was in Gek space yeah. and, and that I could expect for the next hour or two of gameplay uh, of just warping yeah. to be in Gek space. That's, that's something that I think Spore did really well. Yes. Where you start out in a small star cluster of maybe like 30, 40 stars. Yes. And there's one other, maybe two other civilizations with you populated it's worth mentioning by other players content yeah and uploaded right which i think is so fascinating but as for as for like a progression in the galaxy i think what no man's sky could have learned from spore is in spore you start out in a small cluster of stars and then through a bunch of trading you can buy an upgrade to your warp drive that lets you jump from one cluster to another cluster Mm -hmm. And that cluster, all those clusters are kind of in a mega cluster, and then you can buy a new warp drive that gets you out of that mega cluster into a new one, and eventually you're able to just go anywhere you want yeah, in space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think they should have done that with No Man's Sky, mm-hmm. and every kind of cluster of stars has its own sort of regionality of you know, <laughs> feeling. These, yeah, these yeah. planets are around these kinds of stars because blue stars are closer to the center of the galaxy, so we're going to have hotter, younger planets, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to d- determine how exactly the kinds of planets you find are or regionally. the ones on the outside are older therefore they're the ones that have the old ruins yeah and the closer you get the younger the civilizations you're going to encounter are right and already with just those five or six statements we've got a better game. story <laughs> we've got story yeah because mm-hmm. it's gonna do you want to go to the edge of the galaxy mm-hmm. where they're all the ancient aliens are uh-huh or do you want to go to the center of the galaxy where there's new things to discover yeah and, and the living, other thing, living things that have technology yeah the other thing that spore had too is you get close to the center of the galaxy is there's this big existing empire out there that's hostile to everyone unless you manage to befriend them the fact that you can befriend them i think it's is true. actually super interesting yeah. but also i didn't um, know that actually but going back to the yeah. well, the idea hard, you had possible. of like I'm I'm spending the next few hours in Gek space. If you are standing with the Gek, because they're just standing in No Man's Sky, but it's more like you get more benefits for being even more friendly with mm-hmm. them. Nobody's really hostile towards you. And now maybe that doesn't need to be part of your game, but I think it would be interesting if kind of, uh, you know, like Fallout New Vegas style, other games like this. Well, civilization. Even, even World of Warcraft Civilization. You have standings with different races or maybe even different kind of um clans and factions yeah factions within these races or something like that where um i'm in hostile space now that's going to make my game very different than being in friendly space do i want to go around through friendly space do i want to go through hostile space do i want to make friends with this hostile it's like that in sport too yeah yeah and so like if you kind of like sword of the stars look it up (laughs) um so that's all i have to say about that (laughs) if you kind of combined you know, kind of the the ideas behind how Spore did their space age with more of the gameplay of No Man's Sky. Um, that might be something pretty interesting. Um, maybe you even have like, you know, again, the sort of 
the goal you're going for sort of idea. Um, I like the idea, like I said, of kind of the four X of like your objective is to help grow this empire, mm-hmm. but that's not the direction we seem to be going with our particular mm-hmm. idea. So maybe it's something more like, um, kind of along the lines of the Artemis quest, actually of like, you're trying to find someone maybe interstellar style. Um, you know, the movie interstellar, uh, you're trying to find some of the advanced explorers we had because they think that they found something important, but we can't reach them now Mm -hmm. or we need to go rescue them. So your goal is they've been there before. So there is some stuff that's charted and we know that there are other species out there, whatever. Just make it a rescue mission. Yeah, it's it's a rescue mission. And so it's exploration from your perspective because you're experiencing it for the first time. But it's not it's not an exploration expedition, if that makes yeah. sense. It's, it's yeah. a rescue mission that involves exploration because right. it is unknown territory to you. Wow. So what, what I'm getting is that the assets for a, for world building yeah. per, per the video yeah. uh, that, that you were talking about earlier, this, you know, the series um, it's there. Yeah. It's there. We have the technology. We can build it. <laughs> we can push the generate universe button. Yeah. All you need to do to fix no man's sky is uh instead of making it homogenous where all the green stars and red stars and blue stars and yellow stars are mixed together Mm -hmm. just put all the blue stars at the edge Mm -hmm. put all the red stars in the middle and call it a day i guess scientifically it would be the other way around i'm I'm not sure if mechanically that would work but i get i get what you're saying yeah well you'd have to you know you'd have to tweak some things it's not that simple you're you're starting from known space civilized space space where you have lots of places you can fall back to Uh and progressively gets harder and harder and harder and by the end you're completely on your own okay now we're getting into uh flow territory if you remember the old game flow Mm. um geneva chen is that right um flower was another one from Mm -hmm. um that game series uh not really, but I mean, it was it used the same. It used flow theory is what it really yeah, did. Yeah. So what you're really talking about here is flow theory is that if it's too hard, fall back. Um, if it's too easy, go forward. And the closer you get to the center of the universe, the harder it is. That was Spore. That's yeah. exactly what That's Spore exactly was. That's exactly what Spore was. Yeah. And um, I think ultimately what we need now, uh, the next next expansion, is the story expansion. I think that's what we need. We need yeah. the, We need the quest if they're going for single word expansion DLC, how about this one? Quest. <laughs> because then that it's going to give us meaning. It's going to inject um, meaning into yeah. it. And, and there, I'm not talking about little missions, which are just flavor and skin. There, There is a quest, and that's why I recommended mm, it earlier. Flavor. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a quest, and that's why I recommended you start a new game. Um, to, to a see quest, it. but I'm not talking about a quest. Yeah. Well, I'm not talking so about mainline quests, and I'm not yeah. talking about side quests. I am talking about the idea of being able to use the same kinds of technologies they've already got in right. place to link things together. Make it a make it a not a story set in a homogenous world. Right. Make it an adventure point A to point well, B. Well, yeah, some of that, and, and a little bit of curated content. Another way to put it is, if if I've encountered a world that has a um, a crashed freighter. Mm -hmm. recently i don't want to encounter another one for another let's call it dozen worlds yeah or systems really at least and if you've encountered an ocean and oceans are rare to encounter another ocean that quickly yeah that's a foul yeah and and the reason why it's happening is because it truly is random yeah and i mean that as a as a slight insult as a slight (laughs) as an insulting slight because (laughs) the you know random done right is great you know, dice rolls are random. Yeah. Uh, swinging a sword and, and whether or not you hit, that's that's random, right? You almost need like a card draw system. Yeah, of, something like, there th- you th- go. This thing's going to happen X many times in a given player's game. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe even just once. Until it happens again. Mm-hmm. Like or, until you've done all the things and then it can start happening again. Maybe, or maybe there literally is something that only happens once. Sure. In a game. I, that that if, makes if perfect sense. If it's like sense. big and impressive enough or something like yeah, that. I completely agree um, with that. Well, even if they'd done something as simple as, as flipping the asset um, as a mirror image so that it wasn't the exact same crash twice. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. For, for the, for the crash. For well, you. and so I think what would be interesting is like, you don't just encounter a crash, you witness a crash. And what ends up happening there cool. is they build yeah. into like the physics engine and stuff like that, like the way that it scatters when it crashes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to look different on every planet because the terrain is going to be different. The oh, way that it came in is going to be a little bit different. That's a, maybe more advanced physics. That's than a Hello ton Games of work. Engine, yeah. But yeah. yeah. And I think that 
I have faith. I think they're going to get there. I yeah. truly do think they're going to do all of these things in time. You have to give them props for not just taking the money and running. Mm-hmm. I agree. So, I completely agree. And it may there may come a point where they need to change the title and come out with a different game that is the game No Man's Sky was pitched as. <laughs> um, or Or maybe this game will evolve to a place where we can restore faith or they can make a sequel even well just yeah no but Sky 2? i don't know I, I, I almost said that but then i was like eh, no. yeah, even even that wouldn't work Sky. that wouldn't work <laughs> so they not they, not only would they steal from themselves but the, anyway yeah i matter. mean I, yeah, the point, it, yeah. I, i've resisted <laughs> i've resisted the urge to really get into mmo design territory with some of my suggestions mm-hmm. but um ultimately i think for our um, fantasy game that we're talking about here, not to be confused with the fantasy game. Mm-hmm. Um, this sci-fi... Our ex- hypothetical game. Our hypothetical uh, sci-fi our dream exploration game. dream game. Um, <laughs> I think for me to truly enjoy it, it needs to have something that is enough of a payoff over the hill mm. so that it actually does get that... Well, it's a slot machine. It's what it really is. It It's... It's supposed to be a uh, uh, going over the hill and, and seeing a pretty thing or going over the hill and seeing a huge gold deposit or mm-hmm. going over the hill and seeing a dragon that's going to kill you. It could be any of those things. And that's why I want to go over the hill. Yeah. And I think that that brings me to kind of if I'm pitching in short form, the thing that I think would make for my personally like ideal exploration game along these lines um is there is some sort of rescue mission you're trying to get out there to recover some person who discovered this important thing on like kind of an, an outer scouting mission or something I like, like that. that you have an empire sent out a distress yeah. signal 300 years ago and it just arrived because that's how time works <laughs> <laughs> whatever the case whatever the case is but they have portals um, so it's fine <laughs> but you also have the backing of your empire your society whatever behind you and so it is kind of combining that 4x idea but it's t- for the aim of doing this thing so like i get out to a planet that looks like it'd be for make for a good outpost i get there i help to establish a base and now there's a base that i can return to if i need it but also they can launch say like supply runs to me if i'm out there in the middle of nowhere and i need to refuel they can send someone to help or something like that and then like so basically you're able to go as fast or as slow as you want to like build up sort of a support structure behind you on this mission Mm -hmm. um and if you want to if you're really skilled you could just strike it on your own with basically no help and just focus on getting there as quickly as you can i think that also supports different play styles of sure um, sure i just want to get to point a get to point b as quickly as possible while other people kind of in all in, in another sort of like rpg sense want to grind a little bit more to build up their levels in other words to really establish a strong um infrastructure in their wake mm-hmm. that can be used as a support they'll make things a lot easier once they get near the end yeah yeah so there's tons and tons and tons of data for one very specific mmo that we have not talked about and that's eve i was going to yeah. mention eve, eve oh, online uh, but because <laughs> the the freighter crash is something that actually like i thought of eve online when i was mentioning that yeah. because what can happen is you have a giant battle between players and a giant capital ship can be shot down Mm -hmm. and that event, whether or not it's actually happening procedurally through the gameplay or this someone noticed and decided to populate it, um, that capital ship crashing onto the planet below becomes this new part of the landscape Mm -hmm. or something like that. And if you can kind of come up with some way where even in a single player campaign where you encounter some dogfight that's happening, freighter gets shot down. Now there's a freighter crash on that planet. Yeah. Um, and it's just a clear consequence of something that you saw happen in the game. Um, kind of going back to some discussions we've had before about good GMing, you mm-hmm. know, showing that um, the things that happen in the world around you and it's a living, breathing world with choice and consequence. Yeah. That's literally um, the systemic reason I, game design like yeah, Breath of the Wild. Exactly. Uh-huh. And so I think that a systemic game, it's got like a good driving force for the player um, and focuses on the right things given the goal. Again, if the idea is it is a rescue mission, we can have survivalist elements. We can have maybe a little bit of infrastructure behind you and stuff like that. And there's a clear objective that you're trying to work to. And then again, you could ignore it. You could just be like, I'm going to just go explore left and right instead of going straight just because I want to or to gather resources. Uh, and then eventually you decide to return to the mission you can or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I think too. Um, I know in theory you can encounter a planet that someone else discovered and you can see that it was named or whatever else. But if there was some way to access here is a map of the known galaxy Mm -hmm. um, and you can sort of see which parts are dark and which ones aren't. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, hey, I want to contribute to filling out this map. Let me go hit that dark area. Oh, that's so good. 
Um, and that alone is just like, hey, let's work together to flesh out the map of this world. Mm -hmm. And that gives you sort of a meta objective. Yeah, and you can even do that in a single player game too. Like you send your frigates out mm -hmm. on missions to go discover new parts of the world. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode 133 of the backward-compatible.com podcast, our discussion on designing a theoretical, hypothetical uh, exploration game. Uh, obviously, our kind of um, bent in this one was kind of the idea of getting from point A to point B and seeing how we create the sense of exploration and progress and whatever else uh, with yeah. that in mind. Um, there's a lot of different ways we could have approached it. Like we mentioned, I think this episode could use a sequel too, because there's plenty of games that we could draw from that we haven't oh, yeah. mentioned, like Something Starbound not space. Yeah. or, um, you know, we briefly mentioned Elite Dangerous, but I don't think anybody would have played it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, definitely lots of different ways we could have gone with this. And so, uh, if you out there have any ideas about, um, kind of like what you would find most interesting in an exploration game and maybe even some different ideas for how you would go about what we even mentioned here on the cast, uh, feel free to write in, let us know. Uh, we might discuss that on a potential follow-up episode. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. I'm Chris. I'm Doc. I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.